Hi, and welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, we're going to try and see if we can get this Anritsu MS2721B up and running. I picked this up from eBay, and thanks to my Patreon supporters, we can actually afford to experiment with these devices, which can be quite expensive. Now, this one has no accessories and no power supply and no battery, and also no battery cover. So definitely hasn't been turned on in a long time. But this particular one, I think, is a 7.1 gigahertz portable spectrum analyzer from the Spectrum Master series uh, of Anritsu. And the nice thing is that this has the option for tracking generator built into it. So one of these two type N connectors I can see from my angle right now is actually the tracking generator out, and the other one is the RF in, and a couple of other connectors for references and GPS and so on. So fixing this would be quite useful because a 7.1 gigahertz portable spectrum analyzer with tracking generator can be used in a lot of different scenarios. Not only can you measure spectrum, of course, but you can measure gain, and if you have an output coupler, you can even measure return loss. All this, of course, in scalar. But nonetheless, very powerful unit once it gets working, and there's a lot of applications that are built into it if you can get it to boot. I think I've repaired a similar unit in the past that had some memory on the digital side, but we never opened the RF deck part of it, and I don't even think it was the same uh, model number. But anyway, it's going to be something new when we look at the RF tech and see if we can bring it up to date and we'll use it in some of the experiments in the lab. So let's get started. So I thought maybe I should open it up before I turn it on and see what it looks like on the inside in case there is some obvious problem with the unit. But it's a good thing that I did because I discovered a couple of minor issues. So if you look here, there are two flashcard slots and uh, the one is accessible from the outside and there's one is not, and this is the internal one where the unit is supposed to boot from. And there's no flash in here, and to make matters worse, this was completely broken up into pieces. The thing is, you cannot remove this disk without removing this board. So it's obvious that somebody tried to remove it and just ripped it out and broke this connector into many pieces because they didn't want to bother taking this board out. Now, now I'm a little bit more worried because maybe it has some serious issues and they just wanted to sorry, uh, save the application that was on the disk there. Well, I went to the Anristo's website, and I had one of these disks lying around. So I downloaded the firmware back onto this, and we should be able to place it in there and get it to read from this if everything else is working. Now, you've seen me talk about this portion of this instrument from the old model. It's a little different, but uh, it's essentially the same idea. All the DC-DC converters and voltage regulators and conditioning, power conditioning, is underneath this chassis. The final digitizing of the IF section is, I think, here. DSP and the memory over here, and a couple of other units to glue logic everything together and make everything work. There's a couple of uh, places where you can uh, put probably, I think, a GBS maybe would go here, and some expansions which are not populated in this version. LCD connector is right here at the edge of your screen. And everything else is pretty self explanatory. And this side, this is the RF deck. You can see all the cables going back and forth, all the RF lines going in and out, and they are labeled, you know, LO and tracking generator control and all that. So we will take this apart, uh, wh whether it works or not, because I want to see what's underneath it, and we can analyze a little bit of what's happening in here from both the tracking generator as well as the RF input point of view. Fan here to blow across all the voltage regulators and perhaps even cool the battery. And this is where the battery would sit. And of course, uh, we don't have one. So I'm going to have to take a look at that and see if I can source the battery cover as well. Because without it, the battery will just fall out. So let's go and uh, try it, so a couple of uh, experiments here and see if we can get it to boot. Now, these cables were disconnected when I opened it, but I'm not surprised. If somebody just ripped this up, they didn't bother connecting these cables back. So we can connect, and there's a tiny kink in this cable. But I don't think that's a major issue. This is where all the power and control will be going back and forth between the two halves. So this is a pretty important cable to make sure it's working. Uh, batteries looks good. There's no leak on there. Everything else looks fine. So after what felt like about a couple of years, I managed to get all the screws off. And you know, all these screws are different sizes. So I had to lay them out very carefully so that I can put them back where they came from and kind of draw a line so I know where I took them from. But this is a tracking generator board. This is a connector which goes to the front. That's the tracking generator. Let's lift this up and see what's underneath. And ta-da, look at that. It's quite beautiful, as always these microwave devices are. So let's zoom in a little bit more, analyze it very briefly, and then see what we can do underneath it. There's going to be just as many screws to take the RF deck apart. I'm still contemplating whether I want to do that or not. But at least let's take a look at this first. So here we have the tracking generator section, and it is a little different than what I was expecting. Normally, tracking generators are nothing more than a tone generator, and typically done by just grabbing the signal that is used in the main down converters of the primary RF deck, and use that to, to draw something that's perfectly in sync with the RF, so you can do measurements. 
uh, in conjunction with the RF sweep. Now this seems to be quite a bit more complicated because instead of just using a simple mixers and VCOs and perhaps a PLL to accomplish that, what they have is this analog devices chip. This is an 806623 and it's a fully digital chip. It's a four channel independent digital transmitter in a single package where you can combine the outputs if you choose to in a single digital output. Now the advantage of something like this is it's essentially like a DSP with four independent channels to program and configure various kinds of uh, digital transmitters and these are used in direct digital transmitters in, in uh, cellular GSM and other kind of applications. Even in phase arrays and beamforming, if you want to do IF beamforming, for example, you could do this type of chipset. So this is not what's generating the tone. And they follow that right after with the DAC, one of the analog, analog devices DAC. This is a TX DAC, again, designed for doing transmit DAC direct digital to analog converter for digital transmitters. So the data that's processed by this and generated by this is fed to a DAC, and then we have an analog analog output, which can then be used uh, to mix in with other signals to generate a tracking generator signal. Now this gives us a lot of flexibility, and you can see some kind of a CPLD FPGA up here, which uh, grabs the data and then processes it through this and then sends it to the DAC. This combination is almost like a DDS, but with a lot more flexibility and configurability. So I wonder if this unit can generate a fairly complex modulated uh, signals directly from the tracking generator, making it much more valuable to generate the complex signals from this port. The rest is what you would expect. So from here we can see uh, that the chain I just described to you and the output of the DAC goes to a transformer a balance to create a single ended output and the clock for the DAC is coming from here and then goes into the DAC itself. You can see the clock is also fairly nicely filtered and amplified or whatever is necessary uh, in order to get it uh, conditioned for the DAC itself. And then at the output of that we go into a saw filter and the output of the saw filter then goes over here and begins mixing with various signals. Now if you look carefully there is a signal coming out of here from the bottom and a signal coming out of here from the bottom as well. These are LO1 and LO2 of the main RF DAC and those are in synchronous with the RF sweep. That's how everything stays synchronized and of course the 100 megahertz clock coming into the DAC is also synchronized with the main sweep. So everything is coherently locked together. After that it's really important to get rid of every kind of harmonic and every kind of um, a frequency tone that you might have that's not exactly where you want it to be and that's essentially what the rest of this is about. Aside from the various mixers to generate the different bands of frequency because in a 7.5, a 7.1 gigahertz spectrum analyzer like this you don't have a full 7.1 gigahertz signal running everywhere. That wouldn't make any sense. These are all super, slide, uh, super heterodyne sliding IF multiple conversion stages inside the RF deck and they're using the LO signals for those in order to accomplish the tracking generator in a similar fashion. You can see different bands here. So there's RF switches here, 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 and so on. And this allows you to pass the signal through different bands and apply different filtering depending on what frequency you're targeting. And all of that at the end eventually reaches one point. You can see the final switch over here combining the signals from every single one of these I'd imagine how much loss you would have in different kind of these mixers, band pass and low pass and high pass filters, and very different kinds over here. I've explained how these things work in various uh, different uh, of my videos, but after that you get some uh, filtering and amplification. Finally, yep, there's some definitely some amplifiers over here. I may, uh, this looks to me like a VGA, uh, some kind of a gain control perhaps. And then afterwards, the output over reaches over here some more stop filters over there, some more attenuation, amplification, selection, and then finally to the output. Interestingly enough, there's some, there's some room for additional blocks here and potentially being fed from the bottom and then, then you can have even more complicated things. Uh, there's so many places this can be fed from underneath. Uh, from the RF deck that not everything is populated depending on what options you have but uh, in this case you can see the components here are not populated so the signal just simply goes over here but you do have the option of sending it from here as well and then getting something else and doing some other fancy there's an interesting component uh, that is here it must be a very high quality factor filter some more filter over here mixers from Moray and, and that's it there's pretty much nothing else in there is if you wanted to reverse engineer this it will take some time but the principal operation can be captured just by briefly looking at it. And uh, these, these, so these three mixers in conjunction with the LO signals are going to give you all the frequencies you want. Now at the back of this, we get 
where the signals are fed from the other side. So this pin over here and this pin, these two coax connectors, go through all of the RF shields and plug into the RF deck. Even more filters in the back because they just simply couldn't fit it all there. Memory that's connected directly to the FPGA at the back, which then communicates with the digital IF transmitter. And that memory is here so you can store the data onto this and then play it back continuously. So it kind of feels like a DDS broken into multiple pieces. But other than that, really very nice design and simple in a way. I wonder once if we can get it to work. I'm very curious if there are any other fancy things we can do with the tracking generator, considering the flexibility of having a digital transmitter and a digital DAC there, a TX DAC. So let's go and see if I can take the rest of it apart and see uh, what the RF tech looks like. Now, having seen this, it would be cool to see where those other signals are coming from. Let's keep going. And here is the RF deck, and I had to take all those screws that I only cried twice, which is not too bad. And so here's the RF input, and you can see they're using mechanical switches as opposed to solid state switches for the front end switching. And a lot of the modern instruments tend to have highly linear solid state switches, typically not obviously in silicon, but allows you to avoid these mechanical switches, which not only age, but also are quite bulky. But having this gives you uh, extremely good repeatability and very li good linearity. But of course, you can hear them clicking uh, when it's working. And you know, very, very high-end instruments still use uh, these type of relays. And I've actually changed one of these in some of the repairs I've done in the past for different instruments. Afterwards, switching between the different bands, you can see here is done with solid state switches, different frequencies for different bands, going into different mixers in a multi-conversion stage. Now, I've talked about these again in the past and how these uh, multi-stage conversions for spectrum analyzers work. But it's interesting to see on Ritsu's approach. And this, you can tell this is a fairly old instrument because of the size of some of the soft filters and components that are required. But other than that, this is kind of a block diagram you would expect to get. I also don't see where the main frequency generation is handled. So it must be coming from the other board. And you can see many more filters and mixers here, here, more, more of the filters going around. Here's another mixer there. And these test points that you see are not actually connected to anything. These must be factory testing and calibration, and they're not otherwise used. And look how close they bring the connector to the main board to, to reduce the noise figure of the receiver as much as possible and give you the best uh, the basically signal integrity you can to get the highest dynamic range from the instrument and they're using obviously high-end mechanical switches and so on to ensure that you don't damage the signal. Here's some more soft filters, some more mixers. Here's another similar uh, FPGA to the other board which you, once you configure then controls everything and all the glue logic together. The final IF comes out of here at 37 and a half megahertz and that's what goes to the other board. And I believe from the other board, we also get uh, the main frequency synthesis, which I think would make sense because the GPS receiver would be on the other board. And I think uh, near the ADC portion, the final digitizing portion is probably where we have the 10 megahertz generation and then ultimately getting multiplied and everything else. But other than that, I think it's pretty clean and pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we can see again multiple filters and these are huge and this is fa fairly old, I think, but looks quite nice. Now that we've seen everything, I think it's probably time to put it back together, if I can put it back together, and then we can go ahead and try and measure something. And I, I see some discoloration here, but uh, I wonder, no, that's just maybe because the width of the lines are not the same. Interesting that it doesn't have much coating on. I wonder what this material is. It could be silver, but normally this is that uh, you don't see them exposed like this. You're, you're not supposed to really be opening this and, and exposing this. You can see the side, the parts, look at here. This is where it's exposed outside of the, the entire cage, and you can see the color is changing when it's exposed to oxygen and exposed to elements in the air and moisture. And whatever is inside this, you, it doesn't have the discoloration. You can even see the traces of where the cage is pressed down on it. And I think I put that somewhere. Where did I put it? Here it is. For example, you can see those traces are the traces that are on, on here, and this is conductive paste touching this, so you can get a nice, good ground. I've talked about this in the past many times. So this is definitely not good to have it exposed to the outside. Once the surface gets rough, the losses of these traces, the skin losses of these traces get much, much worse because you get surface roughness and you get extra resistance on the surface of the material. So I picked up this Hitachi screwdriver, electric screwdriver with torque limit, which is nice because you can just uh, put them onto these screws and close them up and the torque limit will bring it to exactly where you want it. Very useful for taking these kind of microwave devices off and it has quite a few different settings for torque limitation. I'll put this on the link to you if you want to buy something like this for yourself. If you do a lot of this work, this seems to be a pretty good one. 
So I thought maybe it's a good idea to try and turn it on while it's kind of sitting in pieces. I, I took this out of the chassis as well, and this is just sitting on top. I haven't put all the screws back in, and even the tracking generator is not even sitting on top of it. So the tracking generator is not connected, and you can see the reference to it is not there. But we can still try and turn it on and see if it at least boots, so we don't have to close it and open it again. I'll try this button over here. And, well, that's a good sign. At least we get a symbol there. So let's see what happens uh, and if it actually boots from the flash disk that I put in. And it usually takes a bit of time normally, if I remember correctly, the last unit that I had did take some time. There you go, that's a good sign. So it says loading application, so that's still good. Let's let it keep going and see if it actually comes up. Okay, it, it did make some clicky noises, so the relays certainly did switch, that's a good sign. And, uh, well, it's taking a long time. I hope it doesn't get stuck in this, because firmware debugging is just really annoying. Oh wait, it's going. It did do, I think it did this on the old unit as well, where it pauses briefly as it's trying to load something up. Ah, there we go. That is, uh, wow, that's a lot of tones. <laughs> that's a lot of tones. It does say low battery, but there's no battery in it. I wonder if that low battery is the CMOS battery, uh, or it's the fact that actually there's actually no battery at all. So, you know what, I have a feeling, let me see if I can hold this with one hand here. So I'm going to push down on the cage there, and check it out. If I push down really hard, I can get rid of most of the tones. If I let it go, they come back. I mean, this is a perfect example of how important these things actually are. Because it's doing many conversions, and there is many LOs with a lot of power and a lot of passive mixers, or even just uh, even active mixers, they're everywhere on the sport. If we don't shield them, they couple to each other and they get down converted within the IF band as it is sweeping. So if I don't screw these down, I will get all those tones. And this is hopefully a good demonstration for you to appreciate the significance of these. And there's, there's a reason why there are so many screws, of course. Every time you open one of these, there's you know, 50 screws on there because each cavity has to have pressure on all points. Signal can leak in. We're talking about you know, leakages of 60 dBm below. You still don't want to have that. So hopefully this clarifies a little bit further or at least solidifies the importance of those screws. So it looks like it's running other than the fact that uh, it is not screwed in. So let me tie all the screws back down and then turn it back on and see how the tones look like. So far, the sweep looks good. I don't see any particular errors. I don't have access to the button, so I can't run a self-test until I put, thi put this back in the chassis. But that's a good sign. Well, here is something really strange. So once I closed all the screws, it now says LO1 lock error. So when the screws were loose, it didn't have any problems. But now that I've tightened everything down and I was about to close it, I just turned it on for one more time. And you can see that it does indeed have some problem here in the middle. And when it's trying to get to that sweep, there is an LO1 lock. So looking close at the back of the main RF port, I've identified some more of the components. We have some voltage control oscillators here. There's three of them for three different bands with a switch that gets selected between them. And each of them is then controlled by the synthesizer chipset from analog devices. There's another synthesizer here for a different frequency band. Now, having said that, it means that this entire section is responsible for producing the, the PLL that you see. So right now, this LED is blinking ever so gently here and there, and this is because we're switching between these VCOs continuously. So in between different transitional points before the PLL acquisition happens, you get a little bit of an unlock condition, but that's not actually uh, important. What's important is when it is in between, the when it's actually locking for when it's doing the sweep and it's do working correctly right now. But the problem is that if I take this and I press down on this board, you can see, if I press hard enough, there it is. You can see now it's permanently unlocked. And if I let it go, it will go back to the normal condition. So there is a loose connection somewhere, and this is going to be a nightmare to find. Now, it could be a cold solder joint from one of the components. It could be a trace to the other side of the board. Uh, if VIA has failed, ah, that's going to be a bad one to try and find. Well, there's no other choice but to go under the mantis, look for it, and see if we can figure it out. So after some more investigation, I kind of nailed down the architecture of this PLL. So we have three VCOs here, one, two, three and they are selected by a switch, amplified, and then filtered, and so on, and then fed back onto the PLL, which is just outside of the view right now. So there, these three VCUs operate in three different bands, and the system automatically selects 
whichever one is required for the frequency that is supposed to be generated. So I can actually force the instrument to use only one of these PLLs by restricting the frequency sweep to a certain range. So I tried this one, this one, and this one, and I found out that these two always seem to work. No matter how much I bend the board, they always generated the correct output. But this one, which now I have decapped, wasn't cooperating whenever I pressed down on the board if this VCO path was selected is where the problem was actually happening. So I went and I took the cap off. Actually, I won't be able to focus on this very well, would I? No, it looks like this is the best we're going to be able to do. But uh, there it is inside of it. If you can see, let's see if we can get a better view of it for you guys. Inside of it, we have the active device in the center. This little black dot over there, that's our reactor. Everything else is for biasing. The output is taken from there. So by putting a voltage onto this path, the control voltage, we're changing the capacitance of this reactor and changing the VCO oscillation frequency. And here's the power supply. Look at all the filtering put in there. And then on top of that, there's filtering inside of this device as well, of course. And here's the output taken. I, I touched it up a little bit here as well. But it seems like it doesn't do that anymore. So if I push down on it, you can see that the light never becomes solid like it was doing it before. So it seems to be cooperating a little bit more. So let's go ahead and close it back up and see if we can figure out uh, if this was the only problem. So I went ahead and I constructed a new cap for it. It's just a piece of copper I soldered back in to close it to preserve the, the good isolation and insulation it has. So that's going to be all great. And I'm measuring it right now. Uh, the LO seems to be working quite nicely, as you can see. It's sweeping and it's remaining locked the whole time. So I think it is working now. So now the question is, can I put it back together? And then we can actually test to see if the whole thing works. And now it's not sensitive to pressing it. It always remains locked. Excellent. So let's put it back together. Okay, here's the unit back together. And I did manage to find a replacement door online. So I bought that. So now we have this thing to put over here. And because I'm such a genius, I also bought a battery, but I bought the wrong size. So this is actually too small. I bought one size too small, unfortunately. But I padded it so that it would fit still inside the unit. And these are really all the, the same voltage and everything matches. So the only issue is can you get uh, the connectors line up perfectly. And I think this, this padding allows me to line it up. And I cut this open so we can see uh, it's 25% charge right now. So let's put it back together, connect it to the power. I'm very eager to see what happens. And here is the unit all back together. Looks pretty nice. The battery charge was really low, so I had to take it out of the unit and charge it separately because when the battery power is really, really low, it doesn't like to charge it and it just shows up this fault light meaning that the battery is no good. But everything else seems to be working. It's sweeping without any problems. So I have it now connected to my MXG and we're going to apply some tones to it and see if we can uh, display those tones at the correct frequency. So right now I have set the MXG, uh, or I should say the EXG, to one gigahertz. Let's turn it on. and. There it is. Look at that. It works. And there's a peak search over here. There it is. The frequency, 994 megahertz. Of course, they're not locked together. But the power, minus 0.68 dBm is correct. There's some cable loss and connector loss over there. But it looks good. Let's increase the frequency to make sure that it is working across all frequencies. Now, this EXG goes up to 6 gigahertz, but it shouldn't matter. So here's 2 gig, 3, here's 4, here's 5, and here is six, and we can do another pick search on this to make sure it is working. And yes, it looks good. So I think it is operating. Now, one of the things we haven't tested is the tracking generator. So why don't I get a tunable filter, and we can hook it up to the tracking generator up here and see if we can make uh, some insertion loss S21 measurements, uh, scalar measurements, of course, using the instrument. If that works also, then the whole unit is functional. So let's try the tracking generator here. So I have connected the uh, the tracking generator output to the spectrum analyzer input directly so we can do a normalization. I have set the power to 0 dBm. Let's turn the tracking generator on. It takes a moment for it to come on. It's not the fastest instrument in the world. And check it out. That looks pretty good. It's fairly, fairly flat and it's got some nice uniformity to it. So now if I go under S21 insertion loss, I can normalize it. And once I normalize it, we're going to have a new trace. And there it is. Now it's normalized. So now we should be able to remove that and connect it to our filter and be able to get a new curve. And it's all the way down there. It's not the nicest color. And here it is connected to the filter. The filter is right over there. And you can see the curve and we can see the bandpass filter. And this filter does not look good outside of its frequency that it's supposed to operate in. Let me zoom in a little bit more because uh, 
it's not it's not choosing the the nicest colors there it is so now you can clearly see this is the center frequency of the filter and the filter has huge rejection you know we're talking about 80 db down here and outside of it it just has multiple resonances uh, so second other modes kick in and it's not working very well above that frequency but i can change the center frequency of the filter and shift it up as you can see and i think this filter goes all the way up to three gigahertz we can set it to three gigahertz there it is, and you can see the fractional bandwidth of the filter changes as we go to higher frequencies. This is normal. If I go under the marker here, I should be able to put a marker on. Can I put a marker on? Where is the marker? Oh, it's sitting on a different trace. Ugh, this is annoying. The GUI of this is not the greatest. Anyway, I've got to figure out how to put the marker on it. But the marker is going to be, you can then measure exactly the bandwidth and so on. And this thing has a ton of software options. Really quite impressive. So if I go under measure, for example, I have a huge list of measurements that's built into it that I can apply. Uh, it's got another mode as well, which I haven't tried yet. It's a PIM anal analyzer. I have to try that out too. But I think it works. Considering, uh, you know, we took it apart completely and it had some that really nasty problem. Overall, I have to say I'm pretty happy with it. Now that we have a fully functional on this two MS2 2721B, you know, you have to do complete characterization to make sure it works. But I think it's pretty good. And again, I can do this thanks to my Patreon supporters. You're the reason why I could you know, buy this. This was almost $1,000. These are not you know, easy, cheap things to risk and buy. And it's because of you that I can do this and bring these kind of uh, videos to you guys. So I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Hopefully the battery is going to come back to life as well. And I'll see you in the comment section.